for example. We have everything that we have to offer or to listen to and share is going to be very interesting over the next few days. And we're going to open with a, a broad a broad sweep of Polani and the first plenary bears the title of the conference, the enduring legacy of Carl Polani. Just to take the image of the family, the network, the tribe, we continue with that for a moment. Uh, I was sitting beside people let me back up and say that as, as the director of the Institute, and as having worked uh, with Carrie all these years, uh, I've had the joy and, and privilege of making some remarkable friends and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, and they are seated with me at the, at the table today. It's a, with great pleasure that um, I introduce to you our four speakers um, this morning, all of whom have contributed uh, to the intellectual life of the Institute and to uh, and to the enduring legacy of, of Carl of Polani. Uh, and they represent the United States, uh, Italy, Europe, and, and Italy, and, and France. Uh, Peggy, Margaret Summers, but Peggy, as, as she is known, Margaret and, and Pe uh, Peggy Summers and Fred Law have published um, a new book called The Power of Market Fundamentalism. I was hoping one of them was on the copy of the Oh, there it is. OK, it's right up there, uh, which I urge and invite and urge all of you to read. Uh, this is um, uh, a very important book. And as Carrie mentioned earlier, uh, it, it is um, extremely um, uh, it is extremely important because it's it's generating a further dialogue um, about the importance of the work of uh, in the English in the English speaking world, and I hope maybe somebody is already eagerly wishing to translate it. Uh, Margaret Summers is a professor of sociology at the University of Michigan. Um, Fred Block is professor of sociology, retired professor of sociology, research, 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 research. research professor, uh, which means that he gets to do what he really wants to do um, at the University of California at Davis. I will introduce all our speakers, uh, and then uh, each will have uh, uh, 15 minutes to, to speak to you. Bob Kuttner, Robert Kuttner, is a journalist and a writer. He's the co-founder and current editor of the American Prospect. I'm happy here um, of the latest issue, which he said to me over coffee is a Polanian uh, issue. Uh, so again, I invite you to um, to subscribe to to the American to the American Prospect, and particularly to a few issues ago in which um, Carl Kuttner has an excellent piece on, uh, on the importance of, uh, of Carl Polanyi. Um, Bob Kuttner has, has uh, published many books. I'm going to be brief with the introductions. Uh, Jérôme Maucourant, maître de conférence de sciences économiques, Université Jean Monnet et Laboratoire Triangle en France, uh, who will speak to us on monetary order and global crises. Um, I'm um, grateful to, to Jerome and for doing this in English uh, today, and I wish to apologize to our French colleagues. Normally, we would have a simultaneous uh, translation. Uh, we were unable to do this this time, so thank you for accepting to um, deliver your, your talk uh, in English. And we have an English version of Jerome's paper as well. And finally, Professor Enzo Mengioni from the from Sociology University of Milan, Nicoca, Italy, The Contemporary Dynamics of Capitalism and the Tension of the Crisis, interpreted within a theoretical frame centered on the double movement. We have four <coughs> excellent, and five uh, excellent speakers, and I will begin by turning it over to Fred and Peggy, and I will ask you to please stay disciplined um, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's great to be here, and um, I want to thank Carrie for her generous comments. And I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing because rather than addressing the agenda of eight questions that she laid out for us, I'm going to talk about something different. Um, Peggy and I are talking about the inter the relationship between Carl Polanyi and Thomas Piketty. Um, the author of Capital mm -hmm. in the 21st century. Um, and I'm just here really as the, the opening act. Um, Peggy will get 
to the good stuff. So why talk about uh, Piketty? Um, I think there are, um, there are basically three reasons. I mean, the first is that um, it was uh, a moment of great global enthusiasm for a work of political economy uh, that was deeply critical of the direction in which the um, uh, neoliberalism, market liberalism had been, been taking us. And second, that the data that Piketty and his colleagues have elaborated on the distribution and income and wealth within the um, in US and, and Europe um, is an extremely powerful x-ray of what has been going wrong in the, in the neoliberal era. But fundamentally, we want to make the argument that um, that Piketty's argument can be dramatically improved by incorporating uh, Polanyian elements and that many of the weaknesses in what he argues um, are the kind of failure to take on board the, the, the Polanyian um, argument. So just very briefly, I, I think you all know that the core of the Piketty argument is that uh, when the return on uh, capital investment is greater than the rate of growth. There's a tendency for income and wealth to become concentrated. Uh, the argument is that that has been true throughout human history, that we get essentially an oligarchic distribution of income and wealth, um, and that that then creates uh, a, a, a system of hereditary wealth. And the argument is that this historic dynamic was broken in the 20th century in the period from around World War I uh, to the, sometime in the 1970s that in the major economies there was a significant fall in both income and wealth inequality uh, across that period and that it has been reversed um, over the last um, 40 years and his argument is that we are now, uh, if we do not do anything, going to enter a new era uh, where inherited wealth becomes um, dominant. Now, the problem that we're pointing to in Piketty's argument is um, that his explanation for this interruption, why, did, why was the period from 1914 to 1975 different and his basic explanation repeatedly in the book is uh, the world wars and the disruption of the long period of post-war reconstruction. It's essentially, um, there was a, a re things got really messy with the First World War and the Second World War. And uh, essentially, th this is where the, the Polanyian argument um, becomes um, relevant because, as Carrie said, one of the fundamental projects of the Great Transformation was to explain why World War I happened. And for Polanyi, central to that was first the class struggle, the, um, the protective counter-movement, the struggle by the common people uh, to gain a greater share of, of economic resources. And the argument is that that uh, protective counter-movement, that social struggle was intensifying um, in the decades leading up to World War I. And second, um, Polanyi's argument is that the intensification of inter-imperialist conflict was precisely because the European powers, in response to the demands from below, uh, pursued empire as a way to reduce the tensions and um, create a, a bit more space. So essentially, Polanyi has an argument that the First World War is not, and the Second World War, which obviously uh, was deeply connected, that these events were not exogenous. They were endogenous to um, the creation of a market economy and the social conflicts that, that generated that, um, that market economy. So, but similarly, at the end of Piketty's period, you know, essentially he says, okay, the disruptive period ended and then we got back to the, you know, the historical trend, which, and here again, um, rather than having uh, an explanation of the crisis that began in the 1960s and 1970s, which is, we know was an economic crisis, a, a social crisis, uh, a period of intensified social conflict um, in, um, th throughout the world, um, 
that rather than having a theory of that conflict as um, representing the exhaustion of a certain period of economic growth and the um, opportunity um, for the, the world economy to pursue a different path, um, that basically uh, what happened was that the left as such failed at that point to propose or to advance an alternative um, path forward and the right filled the vacuum and the right filled the vacuum by resuscitating the same free market, market fundamentalist ideas that, that we talked about. And so I'm just gonna um, really end there but say essentially that the consequence of Piketty not uh, putting the rise and fall of income inequality in the larger context of social conflict and as we argue in our book, ideational conflict, um, means that when he proposes his wealth tax as the solution, it appears utopian, disembodied, disconnected from any actual social struggle, when in fact the story should be that look at this earlier moment, um, con um, uh, agitation from below led to a fundamental change in the way that the system was organized, and this could happen again, but, um, but it points to the, that it seems to me the deeper problem, which is that uh, the wealth tax makes sense um, only if it's linked to uh, a political program which says this is what social and economic development could look like in the 21st century. Um, again, it's the problem that uh, we as a left still lack a vision of what is the nature of the restructuring of the global economy um, that could create uh, a sustainable uh, and more egalitarian world economy, at which point I turn it over to Peggy. Thank you, and uh, I'm going to just uh, speed through a bunch of slides which uh, really make the same point at a slightly more abstract level. Um, in a um, room full of um, dedicated Polanyites, um, nothing I say about Polanyi is going to strike anybody as particularly new. I forget how I moved. Do I just click this? No. Oh. This. Okay. Got it. Um, nothing I say about Polanyi is going to be news to anybody here, but perhaps the framing of Polanyi in relationship to Piketty um, specifically might be. So again, without repeating uh, the, the Piketty argument, the basic, uh, the basic theme that I wanna, we want to focus on is how he essentially makes a division conceptually, um, it seems to be unconscious almost, between the economy and, and uh, politics and the state. And therefore, he focuses his solutions on redistributive practices <coughs> and of course, most famously, the global wealth tax. And therefore, um, and in the interim period, of course, the wars, et cetera. And therefore, he, he's arguing that the variation in levels of inequality are explained not by the fundamentals of the market, which he calls the laws of capital, um, but by the level of exogenous intervening factors that go on, whether or not you have uh, regulations and redistributive practices or wars and external conflicts. And therefore, for him, the action is not happening at the level of constancy in the market, but in the outside. So what, uh, here's the sort of picture of his argument, which is you've got the free market or the R, R is greater than G. It leads to a set of natural market outcomes, which are increasing oligarchic concentration of wealth. In a situation that we're in the 70s plus, we have an absent circle on the right, meaning the symbol of deregulation. Supposedly, there isn't the same level of intervening political power. And that combination, uh, the effect of the absence of regulations, uh, leads to um, the rise of inequality. And this, and this diagram, of course, is just the converse, that it, the reduced inequality happens uh, when you have a different kind of exogenous influence. Um, and I'm making the distinction here between primary uh, distribution, or what we like to call pre-distribution, which he's leaving as a constant, and redistribution, which is supposedly happening on the outside. 
And therefore, his solution is that if we change the external conditions, then we will have a change. Now, from a Polanyian point of view, this uh, binary between some pre-political, pre-distributive economy is untenable. Um, it implies that there is this thing called a natural market that are modified by these outside um, events. And this is a, a quote you're all, of course, totally familiar with, if not have memorized it by heart, about how the markets depend on the, the state. Um, so for Polanyi, government action is not interference. It's not the outside coming in. It's, it's simply that there is no economy in the first place that isn't constituted foundationally on politics, government, etc. And for Piketty, he's naturalizing the unequal power, because he really isn't dealing with power, that's in the market by simply neglecting the presence of power inside of the economy. So Polanyi argue, would argue that it's not whether there is the state or not the state that's influencing this natural sphere of the market. Rather, as inside the circle here, there is a mutual constitution within this world of pre-distribution. It's not pre-political at all. Pre-distribution is just as political. It is constituted through this mutual interaction. So for Polanyi, the notion of deregulation is a complete um, uh, non, a non-existent because you, there can never be a deregulated free market. The question is not whether there is state intervention. The question is for what purpose and to whose benefits are those regulations being served? What, what is the purpose? Do they, are they designed as they have been for the last 30 years to redistribute wealth upward? Um, to steal wealth, if you will, to set uh, wages more likely from, from below, or the, uh, the utopian opposite, to benefit the common good. So that's why we, we don't feel comfortable with this notion of deregulation and use the term re-regulation, that you have a shift, not in whether there are regulations, but they are re-regulated from the old ones of the New Deal, to the uh, post-70s Reaganite um, neoliberal ones. And therefore, uh, it is the result, the argument is, of deliberate gov government policies, tax policies, uh, trade policies, I mean, everything that we all know. Now, this is a crucial turning point here, as I get to the end, which is that at the same time, we don't want to suggest that this term deregulation is a myth. We want to stress that Polanyi and anyone who knows chapter 10 of the Great Transformation, which is the ratchet chapter of the entire book, The Invention of Political Economy, knows that Polanyi puts as much stress on the ideational powers of political economy, even though it's built on a complete fictitious foundation of nature, right, and the so-called Biologist, biologization of human ontology, he says it's, it's just because it's a fiction doesn't mean it doesn't have causal powers. The market is not just politically embedded, it is ideationally embedded, which is an argument we make extensively in the book. The trick here is to recognize that this word deregulation is really a code word for what is supposed to symbolize a return to natural market outcomes, you're supposed to get rid of the state, but what we really know is that when the word deregulation is used, it simply is a word that describes, hidden in plain sight, what happens when income and resources are distributed away from the poor and the middle classes upward to wealth and capital, all the while telling us that what emerges from the natural market is the natural outcome because now we've deregulated. So deregulation basically means uh, Reaganite policies of state intervention into uh, organizing of the economy in a way that benefits wealth. So we don't want to suggest that deregulation is irrelevant because it has the causal powers to convince people that we have returned to some natural state. And there are plenty of people who are in love with natural states, right? Um, especially Americans. Um, I'm going to start crying. Um, so um, uh, the, the um, 
Yeah, um, yeah. So this discourse of deregulation tells people. Oh, I'm almost done. I promise. Um, tells people now we've returned to where people are not being um, hand given dependent, given rewards for not, for sitting on their butts and doing nothing. Uh, now they're being rewarded according to their actual merit and contributions in the market. So as opposed to the distortions, okay. Is this a contradiction? No, we believe that Polanyi's foundational contribution is to argue that both ideational power and structural power go hand in hand. That one is not more true than the other. Even though they are actually saying completely separate things, they are both necessary. The, the ide ide ideational force of deregulation is necessary to create what I won't blame this one on Fred, what I call the alchemy of misrecognition. Um, and what that means is that because even the left talks constantly about how terrible deregulation is, we, talk, we are creating this real mystification, this misrecognition that the problem is the free market, when there is no free market as everyone who's a Polanyiite knows. Um, what we really should be focusing on is the, the kinds of state policies that are creating this. So um, not to do so obscures the way that re-regulation is doing the real institutional work. So contra picketing, it's, there are no laws of capitalism. Um, there, are, there is the co-determination of politics and economics that exist in uh, and, and Stiglitz, who of course we know is a bit of a Polanyi and has, has just written a nicely stated thing. And this is just for a nice cheery ending <laughs> on a, such a depressing day, two days after the elections. Um, that, um, yes, there's actually three, there's actually two Carls, as Kari said, but our, our beloved Pope, and we're supposed to be able to identify all those guys, um, Keynes has a double chin, you notice, and, but Carl looks real, Carl, Carl P. looks extremely convincing. Hayek looks like kind of a sleazy guy, doesn't he? And, and good old Carl with his, he, he's reassuring. Um, so we like this pope. I never imagined I'd ever like a pope. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. Thank you, and also thank you for your self-regulated uh, time to be <laughs> so I have to hold up the pieces of paper. Okay. Safe comments. And, and now, uh, Bob, Bob Kuttner on uh, Polanyi and the political economy of influence. And our condolences for the American election. Yes, I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a real honor and a real thrill to, uh, to be here. Um, Harry asked the question, uh, how has this book had so much influence? The subject of my talk is why it hasn't had more influence, mm -hmm. given how Polanyi has been grimly vindicated now twice, first by the tragedy of the interwar period, now again by the uh, dynamics of the collapse of 07 uh, 08. Uh, Margie made the comment in her introduction, Margie, sorry, that uh, Polanyi could not have imagined what was happening, I suspect he could have and, and would have because uh, what happened in 07 and 08 um, grimly follows the, the Polanyi script with the all too predictable political backlash of, of a right wing populism uh, that doesn't solve problems, that just uses anger as a political uh, tool uh, both in Europe and America and as we saw two days ago, the right gains when anger is wielded as a politics. And if you drill down into, into Polanyi's analysis, uh, it becomes even more prophetic. Uh, he believed that the only way uh, politically and intellectually to temper the destructive influence of organized capital was to have highly uh, mobilized and sophist politically sophisticated worker movements uh, as we had in, uh, in Red Vienna in the 20s. Uh, one little footnote, uh, 1932 in Germany, uh, the trade unions put forward the Wojtynski plan, the Vejtej plan, which was for two billion marks of, of public investment. And Brüning, who was at the time chancellor, of course, was constrained to reassure debtors, global financial markets, so the Wojtynski plan was put aside. And Hitler uh, reflated. He just reflated by rearming. And uh, 
as the post war experience showed, you can reflate in a number of ways. I, it's interesting that you raised Piketty because I was going to make a comment on Piketty along the very same lines. Uh, this is going to sound horribly disparaging of one of the few intellectual heroes we have right now, but uh, Piketty is a great uh, economic historical statistician. He's not a political economist. And for Piketty, uh, the main reason that there was this interlude was the destruction of wealth as an accidental byproduct of war. But he leaves out the political economy part of the story, which was that there was also the destruction of capital as a political class, which um, left the opening for social democracy, whether you called it uh, Christian democracy or social democracy or New Deal America, to flourish during an anomalous period when labor and the state and political democracy were mobilized. And that's what accounts for the tonkobias, the, the post-war boom in all of our countries, although the particulars were different. PPT really doesn't get into the politics of, of how this uh, occurred. And since the 70s, capital has resurged as a political force. Now, whether that's natural or whether it's happenstantial, I think uh, it's a tendency of a capitalist economy. And it takes extraordinary circumstances for uh, political democracy and organized uh, trade unions and citizens on the march to serve as a kind of counterweight to the concentrated political power that wealth brings with it. Now, of course, in the Great Transformation, Pliny emphasized at several points that uh, the core imperatives of, of classical liberalism <coughs> were free trade, the idea that labor had to find its price in the market, and the enforcement of the gold standard. Today, we have even more intensive free trade. We have uh, the better to destroy the remnants of the welfare state. We have the uh, savaging of what remains of labor standards to de decommodify <coughs> labor. And in place of the gold standard, whose role was to force uh, nations to put sound money in the interests of bondholders uh, ahead of the real economy, we have the euro, the European Central Bank, the uh, IMF, and the austerity policies of uh, Chancellor Merkel, with the euro locking currencies so that you can't uh, devalue. Uh, and this re-entrenches the, the buy market uh, as, as king. Uh, Small countries are just pawns in this game. Uh, Greek democracy uh, is, is being destroyed. Uh, we have far-right parties gaining. Um, this is the wrong sort of Polanyi moment. It's a Polanyi moment. It should be the right sort of Polanyi moment. Now, uh, I've titled my talk, Karl Polanyi, The Political Economy of, of Influence. And I can offer two reasons why Polanyi is not even more influential. Uh, one has to do with the demand side, whose interest scholarly analysis serves. In this case, it's the anti-Polanyans whose interests serve those of, uh, of organized capital. And the other reflects the logic of uh, academe with its uh, tendency to scholasticism. Um, the reason that the orthodox analysis has been dominated by the likes of uh, Friedman and Hayek and the others who, whose main characteristic in common is that they keep being proved wrong by events. Uh, <laughs> the reason is that uh, neoliberalism is politically congenial, ideationally and politically, to, to uh, ideologically, to, to very wealthy people. Um, obviously, um, neoliberalism doesn't work, although it does uh, serve uh, elites. And uh, in, the, in the course of um, um, researching uh, the, the piece that I did, I, I used Fred and Peggy's book as, a, as an occasion a few months ago in the prospect to do a sort of broad appreciation of, uh, of Polanyi. Uh, I, I, find it, I find it very interesting to compare the careers of Hayek and Polanyi. Now, you know, Hayek taught in the road to serfdom that um, any forms of collect collective activity, even social democracy, uh, were bound to lead to totalitarianism. There's not a single case on record of that ever happening, but there are lots of cases of ultra market leading to backlash which led to uh, the collapse of democracy. But, but somehow, um, Hayek wins the Nobel Prize. And Polanyi at 61, 
uh, is fortunate to get a uh, first, or before he's 61, he gets a quasi-academic post in, a, in an extension program. I guess today you'd call him an adjunct. And uh, finally, at 61, he lands a real academic job in what was then a historically oriented economics department at, at Columbia. Um, now, thanks to Anna Gomez, who uh, sent me just scads of goodies from the archive, um, I learned that uh, when the Great Transformation was trashed uh, by the New York Times reviewer, John Chamberlain, who wrote, and I quote, this beautifully written essay in the revaluation of 150 years of history adds up to a subtle appeal for a new feudalism, a new slavery, a new status of economy that will tie men to their places of abode and their jobs, close quote. Uh, if that sounds curiously like Hayek, it was for good reason. Chamberlain was Hayek's principal publicist, right? And he gets to write the review in the New York Times, and the road to serfdom gets condensed in the uh, in the Reader's Digest, and Hayek goes on to become a kind of a popular uh, intellectual. And uh, meanwhile, in 1944 and 1945, the Great Transformation sells all of 1,701 copies uh, in the United States. So obviously, Hayek is more congenial to rich people than Pallavi, to put it rather <laughs> The other problem is that um, in academia, um, there's a, there's a logic that leads to a kind of scholasticism. And um, uh, by not having an academic discipline, but by being a journalist, pamphleteer, activist, self-taught historian, um, Polanyi was, in, uh, in the words of another splendid uh, refugee scholar, Albert Hirschman, um, Polanyi was a trespasser. And the good thing about being a trespasser is you, you tend to have broader followers. The bad thing is you don't get the normal cadre of graduate students and schools of thought and that sort of thing, except for our tribe here. And I, I plead guilty. I was the one who introduced the word tribe. Um, and I have to say that um, there's almost a secret polite handshake. <laughs> we, we, we've, all, we've all had the experience of encountering an academic, a journalist, uh, some other broadly educated person, and mentioning the word Polanyi. And one of two things happen. You either get a kind of a vaguely blank look, yeah. or you get this broad grin. And I think I do a secret handshake. <laughs> um, I am drawn to Polanyi for, for, for multiple reasons. One of which is that I'm kind of a member of the same tribe. Uh, I'm a journalist. I don't have a doctorate. Uh, Polanyi got his first real academic job at 61. Uh, I got my first real academic job at 70. Uh, I'm now the uh, uh, permanent visiting chair at Heller School, and I even get to supervise dissertations. And this is really cool for somebody who's a graduate school dropout. Um, like many of you, I kind of stumbled on Polanyi happenstantially. I was an undergraduate at Oberlin, and um, my favorite professor was the one who taught me international political economy, who was a guy named George Lange, who was a protege of Oscar Yassi, who was a close colleague of Polanyi, and Yassi, uh, Yassi had found a home at Oberlin for more than 20 years, having left uh, Europe in the 30s, and then he in turn brought George Lange. And, um, you know, reading the great transformation as an undergraduate at 19 <coughs> who had some vague knowledge of World War I. But one's knowledge of World War I was that this had something to do with nationalism. It had something to do with uh, colonialism, maybe. But to have this book say, no, guys, this was all about the social construction of capitalism and the dislocations of that and the reverberations of that, that was just astonishing. And it made me realize that, um, I mean, it was rather hard to be a Marxist in 1963, because this was the heyday of the social market economy, and the working class was doing rather well, and there wasn't much immiseration, unless you looked at African Americans. And so it wasn't a plausible time to be a Marxist. On the other hand, reading Polanyi made you realize that you could be a political economist without being a Marxist although there are areas of overlap, and we can talk about that more in the discussion. Um, and I, I completely concur with Carrie's point that 
Um, had Polanyi uh, emulated Mannheim and uh, Lukács and been an academic, he might have been more influential, but he would have been less original. He never would have had this far-flung set of experiences that uh, enabled him uh, to connect all of the dots that he connected. Now, in the course of doing this piece, I was curious about who Polanyi influenced and who he didn't influence. And I was pleased to see that people in different disciplines, such as Daniel Bell and Ira Katz Nelson, and Jacob Hacker, Joseph Stiglitz, Danny Roderick, Herman Daly, explicitly acknowledged their intellectual debt to Polanyi. John Gray, a uh, recovering fashion writer and uh, author of the best selling critique of you know, liberalism, False Dawn, is effusive in his praise of uh, Polanyi. Martin Anderson <coughs> rather misleadingly used Polanyi when he was advising Reagan to warn that the wrong sort of poor relief backfires. Uh, James Scott, the Yale political scientist and anthropologist, who is kind of goosey about the state, uh, <laughs> says uh, that he read the Great, great Transformation uh, the summer before I started graduate school, and he said in some ways it's the most important book I've ever read. But at the same time, people who you would expect to be Polanyi's don't have him on their map. Michael Walzer uh, never acknowledged him, nor does Eleanor uh, Ostrom, political scientist, uh, uh, whose work on the modern tragedy of the commons made her the rare non-economist to win the Nobel uh, in 2009. Galbraith, you look in the collected indexes of Galbraith yeah. in vain, for Polanyi. Um, also, one, one little jab at, at, at economic anthropology, uh, it's a friendly jab, uh, but it's about scholasticism. Um, embeddedness has sort of been semi-hijacked and is now being used in, in a way that Polanyi would not recognize because the logic of disciplines is to create scholasticism, and if, if Polanyi was anything, he was, he was not uh, a scholasticist. So, to conclude, and Galbraith used to say, you always have to say in conclusion to give the audience hope. <laughs> <laughs> the grim script of what laissez-faire does to society is being replicated in, in an almost uh, perfect template of uh, Polanyi. And I think uh, we need to make Polanyi's influence more broadly felt. And I, I really want to second Fred and Peggy in the sense that we need a better understanding of what it was that happened in the post-war period, when there was a kind of Galbraithian moment of countervailing democratic institutions, fighting capital to withdraw, and creating political and social space where you could have not only a more egalitarian distribution of income, but you could have a more viable society and, and a more uh, viable politics. Uh, today, social democratic Europe has metamorphosed into its opposite. Mm -hmm. Europe was going to be fortress Europe, where we have some kind of uh, social democracy. Uh, Europe is carrying out uh, the neoliberal rigid path even even more intensely than the United States and this is quintessentially a failure of the left. It's a failure of the so-called democratic left. Social Democrats, Blair, Schroeder, the whole damn gang of them with very few exceptions, bought into the whole neoliberal recipe and so now there is no plausible opposition party at a moment when Europe more than anything else, uh, needs a, an opposition to uh, uh, neoliberal uh, shackles. So, uh, Polanyi, besides being the great analyst of capitalism and society, uh, was also a prophet of hope. He was a prophet of learning from history, and uh, we need his influence more than ever.
Uh, my point today is the, the state of the critic uh, of Euro liberalism, uh, what I call the new European order, and I call it the, the poverty of the critic. Because uh, I think we have a big problem with a big part of the left intelligentsia in Europe uh, concerning those topics. I think that the critic has to liberate itself from the myths spread by the ideology of capital, even though it else uh, <coughs> itself hides behind some cosmopolitical rhetoric. Actually, the European Union cannot be considered as a kind of progress because, by now, the aim of these unions is a sort of destruction of the very idea of politics and solidarity. The example of currency, the euro in particular, is of particular interest because the euro crisis provides a, a way to investigate the mediation between the economic and the political. Uh, and doing so, I will show that uh, this crisis enables us to criticize the illusions that are common amongst left-wing thinkers. I think it is useful to recall a sort of Polanyan hypothesis. That is, it is important to note that never money has expelled all political and symbolic dimension uh, from his reality. And it is a strange thing because if you look uh, Euro banknote, for instance, you will see no reference to the European culture, uh, men, events, and so on. And I knew the number three of the central bank in France, and it told me that uh, it was a problem of jealousy between nations. Uh, I was very, very astonished by uh, such a uh, response. I, I think that the reality is because this governor of Central Bank said to me he was a Marxist for many years. And he learned from Marx the importance of economics. So it is clear that this concession of money it is what Marx and Engels called the icy water of egotistic calculation. That is to say, these banknotes is a sort of uh, absolute, absolute neutrality, you know, of human relations. It is not possible to get some identification of a reality in the culture. It is neutral in essence. It's important uh, to, to, to see that. But Polanyi wrote in the Grand Transformation that uh, even during the gold standard, the institution separation of the political and the economic spheres had never been completed. And it was precisely in the matter of currencies that it was necessary to complete because the states whose men seemed merely to certify the weight of coins was in fact the guarantor of the value of token money. This money was not a means of exchange, it was a means of payment. So between uh, the discord of the central bank, the icy water of egotistical calculation uh, of the neoliberal ideology, there is a symbolic, a political symbolic dimension that is very important to me. 
Uh, anyway, if you make a comparison between the United States and Europe, it is very amazing to, to see that the, monetism, the monetization of the public deficits was not a hard trouble, a hard problem, you know, in the USA. Because uh, there is uh, an existence of an American nation. This does not exist in Europe. And note that by now, the essential, the main creditor of the American treasury is no longer China, but the Federal Reserve System. This is impossible in the ideology of pro liberalism. So it is some recall of a sort of Leopoldian point of view about currency and money. If if we consider, if we want to, uh, to have an understand, understanding of the crisis, uh, let's see that money is profoundly ambivalent. Ambivalent. Because money brings violence, acquisitive violence. But in the same time, it is an institution will provide a form of regulation of the excess of social conflict. Aglita and Orléans in the School of Regulation in France uh, have insisted on it. So money as, a, as an institution therefore contains violence in the both sense of the term. And the problem is that the institutional separation of the political and the economic in the so-called European Union has been pushed much further than it has been in the United States, which gives the event affected Europe, especially in the South, a tragic aspect. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, Germany is able to implement such a policy in an American way, you know, of union of transfer of uh, finance, because there is no European people, and the consequence is deflation and migration. There is no exchange in Europe funding a substantial political union where payments made to the benefit to the South would be a compensation for the future payments, allowing to absorb the growing wave of the pension required by this aging nation, Germany. Finally, in a real union, there would be an intertemporal exchange of labor, characteristic of political intensity in construction. But contrary to the ideologies of the both right and left, we must acknowledge a fact. At the heart of the European Union, there is no confidence allowing for this kind of exchange. No feeling of solidarity which allows us to pass bets on the future, to acceptance the uncertainty of gifts. All that remains is the cold demand for payment in cash. This is logic in the apologetics of capital, if I uh, could say the thing like that. But it is strange that Inside the left, there is a, a very important acceptance of the policy of the European Union. Namely, the single currency and the free trade. Uh, it is It is, uh, for, for instance, the notion of deglobalization uh, that is difficult to brought into the discussions. And that, that will uh, my, be my topic now, the, the impasse of the mainstream critic. For instance, you can find to Antonio Negri. 
in the, this kind of new Communist Party manifesto uh, that uh, Tito was empire. Negri claimed with art that empire, the political form of the global market, is wrong. He thought, they thought, that uh, the state of the technology in the 90s allowed the previously unseen form of cooperation from which emerged a de facto communism. Therefore, to the progressive, it was said, just wait a little longer. Deterioration. Would drive us to the best of the world without borders or states. As for the pre-communist the pre world stage was personified through the European nation. So, many left intellectuals during the art debates of the Traité Constitutionnel Européen, the Constitutional Treaty, uh, 10 years ago, uh, have a strange conception of re revolutionary action, it was voting for the treaty, like Valéry Giscard d'Estaing who wrote the treaty. Uh, it is very, very strange when, when you think that in this constitution, the free trade was instituted as a rule and finality. In fact, it was a return to the Marquis de Gournay's sentence, laissez faire, laissez passer. So, it is possible to think that uh, Negri, Alain Lipiet, and so on were the new Marquises of the left, as George Orwell called uh, this strange left. You know. They profoundly weakened the efficiency of the critic by casting anathema of those who were still <coughs> skeptical uh, or the virtue of laisser faire, laisser passer. I think that it sort of returned to Edouard Bernstein's revisionist, revisionism, for which the movement itself was everything, the aim being insignificant. And a strange result of this discourse was uh, a sort of Return inside of the Marxism of a very hard technological determinism. It is a sort of, I think, regression of the critic. But aside the discourses, the reality now, 10 years after these hard debates about the treaty, the reality is that Greek and Spanish people immigrated, fleeing their devastated society toward Germany. Uh, it must be precise that there is a sort of German mania because uh, German bourgeoisie uh, has succeeded. Uh, this, the, the ruling class of Germany has realized the, the dream of the other national bourgeoisie. Prices are low, wages are well contained, order reigns. So, I will conclude, if it is possible, yes. just, uh, Polanyi, in a letter, in a letter sent to Jazzy, wrote that uh, during the gold standard, the financial powers intervened in the internal affairs of every state, because in the area of gold standard, cooperation was only possible if their internal system was similar. Go further, in the new situation, uh, there is very practical important advantage. There is no need to force all states in the world into the pro-Christian bed of federation. So, it is possible to interpret the meaning of the actual European federation. It is a sort of new pro-Christian bed. Un lit de Procuste. Uh, it is a, 
a new form of old liberal capitalism. Okay. Uh, very conclusion? No? <laughs> See, I think. Because uh, we, we get a problem in France with the rising of national front. Maybe you, you know it. Uh, maybe that uh, the, the candidate of this party will be no, not would win the, the ballot the election, but the second person of the ballot system. <laughs> well, maybe it's, it's, <laughs> but it is a prophecy now. The problem is that uh, the secession of the winners, the, that Earth situation in Europe and in France, are capable of causing the sedition of the loser. And the sedition of the loser, it is from uh, it is the the fact to vote to that sort of populist party. The left now is, I think, in France, totally destroyed. And our problem is that the people vote at the right of populist party. Uh, I don't know if it is a prophecy, but it is a bad state of thing. Yeah. things that far right <laughs> because I have too many things to say in 15 minutes. I will try to be disciplined, but uh, uh, the, some sort of the turbulent ideas are turbulent and it is, they, are, uh, they are difficult to repress. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I would have to thank Kari in any case to have put on the floor uh, the, all uh, the questions that I will try to, uh, uh, to answer, but I don't want to create uh, too much expectations. But uh, I'm, I'm particularly uh, uh, keen of trying to tackle the colonialism issue and, uh, 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 and within the double movement. So um, I shall try to, from, from embeddedness uh, and disembeddedness, and uh, I would like we, we have begun the discussion in which uh, it, it is clear that for uh, some sort of, uh, most of the sociologists, most of them have not read Polanyi, uh, they are very keen uh, about the concept of embeddedness because it gives some sort of sociology the capacity to some sort of uh, build up uh, uh, a, a, a way of looking at the difference of uh, the economic context in within society and they, are, they have always been very embarrassed by this embeddedness because they don't know what to do with this embeddedness and uh, with, a, with a disembedding process. And I, at the beginning I was also a little bit embarrassed and then I have learned uh, how to uh, uh, play with uh, some sort of the compatibility between disembeddedness uh, uh, and, uh, and embeddedness has a part of the double movement. 
as the two parts of the double movement. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not particularly, I, I, I know I'm not particularly <coughs> orthodox, and I think this is a, a, a way that Carl Polanyi would have, would have loved, he would have hated people that are some sort of strictly <coughs> orthodox because you cannot, you cannot proceed well if uh, you are always orthodox. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, uh, the importance of a Polanian approach centered on the double movement is the importance of recognizing that our societies are dominated by motion by dynamism, by change. And uh, the, the, the combination between this embeddedness and re-embeddedness forms and uh, uh, institutional building is uh, extremely important in order to understand the society as some sort of societies built on tensions and not on equilibrium. Uh, so th th this, is, uh, this is a very important point. Uh, uh, then I uh, have also, I'm also very uh, keen of uh, 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 underlining something that probably uh, Karl Polanyi had not underlined so much, but which was also in the head of, uh, of Karl Marx, but not so much uh, uh, underlined, the fact that uh, in a way uh, the disembedding, the process of, of uh, commodification has to be support is as within it some sort of a, a sort of uh, emancipation. Uh, it destroys some sort of traditional social bonds and traditional ways of life and uh, brings at certain conditions uh, form of uh, emancipation. And this is why it is diffusing so much and I think all the, some sort of the modern great thinker have uh, understood that uh, some sort of the advancement of market, uh, of market economy is really supported by forms of change in the social bond, which are forms of emancipation. Most of the time they are also some sort of supported by violence uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, all, all and uh, in some cases uh, they are supported by extreme violences when commodification is not accompanied by any form of emancipation. And this is the story of uh, the underdeveloped country. And this is the story of colonialism and of the hidden issue. Uh, the, the, the hidden issue is, that, is uh, the, the story of uh, people that have been exposed to commodification, but exposed violently to commodification, forced to commodification, and that they remain at the same time trapped by form of commodification, and uh, some more the, the tribal, the, the village, the, the poverty of uh, their some sort of traditional life, and the, the, the real oppression of their traditional life. So this is uh, this is a part of the story, and uh, 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 and uh, 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 then the, the, I, I think we should. Uh, there is another issue with which we should develop. Uh, it is not only the the, the re-embedding story is very much a story of social protection, of building instantaneously a new social bonds that protect people from the commodification uh, push. But then there is, I don't think there is a triple part, a, a third part of the, of, of the double movement, but I think there is a, an important part of the story that we have to be, to be well developed, which is the emancipation, the mobilization of emancipation uh, uh, movements. And that is not instantaneous is something which is built up, is something which is, it is in the political scenarios, is something that uh, accompany all the time the double movement, uh, and uh, it, it uh, uh, helps to explain what it is happening. And it is some sort of a, it is a, an agency, so it can be of some kind or of another kind. 
So, uh, and, and then it is important to build up the, way, the different ways in which uh, some sort of the institutional, the, the re-embedding, the real re-embedding force uh, with social protection is built, uh, because in, in that case, uh, we, we, we can some sort of mobilize also the concept of uh, the three pure areas of, uh, of uh, institutional building, reciprocity, redistribution, and market cooper cooperation, which give us some sort of a, a big ground of understanding of how somehow the institutional building uh, is in motion all the time and how it fails or it doesn't fail, it creates some sort of new forms of oppression, it, uh, it, is, it creates bureaucratization and political corruptions uh, and all these kind of phenomena which are typical of our, uh, of our uh, uh, times. Uh, then, um, one of the points which is, which is interesting is uh, uh, I, uh, I am thinking that uh, uh, in a way uh, it is true what we have, that we have said about the influence of Polanyi. Uh, I think that it is also true that Polanyi was not particularly influential in uh, the thinking of the, uh, the industrialized countries in the after war because uh, in, in, in the period, in the golden age, in the 30 years, <coughs> somehow the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the use of uh, enormous resources due to monopolistic control of industrial development uh, made the, the, somehow what, uh, what uh, 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 was called the welfare capitalist country to kill somehow the, the the, the tensions between society. They had in, enough resources from colonialism, from commercial control of the, of the develop, uh, underdeveloping countries, to some sort of build a social protection system that uh, some sort of uh, made invisible the double movement uh, in uh, the industrial developed countries. But the double movement was very visible and, uh, and, and suffered a lot in the underdeveloping countries and, and in, in, in the unequal exchange. No country could join industrialization in between the 1920s and uh, the 1970s. And it is only when some sort of the the transition to the what what was called the part farthest uh, and the industrial decentralization began to diffuse some uh, the possibility of uh, industrial development uh, that uh, we had uh, 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 newly industrializing countries and emerging countries. If you think well, in in, in between 1920 and the 1970s, uh, we have only one exception that confirms the rule of uh, uh, some sort of a, a country joining uh, the industrialized club, which is Israel, uh, which was allowed in. Uh, only a country was allowed in. The other were not allowed in. Argentina tried de desperately and failed, because at the, at the time, uh, the, the control, the industrial uh, uh, technology control was very strong. So let me... Uh, 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 go further and say we are now in an age in which we have to recuperate Polanyi and we have to recuperate uh, the double movement because this explains what it is happening and the, the big tensions between the economy, the financialization, the globalization and the society puts uh, somehow the, 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 the scene uh, of, uh, of our society into a big tension between uh, uh, the, 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 the new forms of commodification, the responses in terms of social protection, the failure of, no, of, of social protection because most of the resources are taken by social inequalities, uh, by the financialization control, by the fact that the bureaucracy now have uh, some sort of increased uh, and, and the political corruption have increased 
the use of resources in other ways than social protection. And the spontaneous and organized responses of the people in terms of decommodification, control of commodification, and, uh, 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 and, uh, 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 and new some sort of uh, uh, ways of responding uh, to the uh, uh, to, to responding to the double movement. So the the, the, the big uh, the big problem is that uh, in a way both in the political area where we have uh, some sort of a, 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 a big uh, uh, deviation uh, built by some sort of the, 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 the bureaucratic and political elite which are fed by uh, uh, enormous amounts of uh, 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 financial resources by the financialization process which is uh, some sort of uh, uh, completely uh, 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 taken out from the <coughs> capacity in, in, in the industrialized countries uh, to build up uh, uh, new forms of social protection. So we have individualization, we have uh, uh, some forms, uh, new forms of, uh, of commodification and uh, uh, less and less capacity from the redistribution system, from the political system to uh, protect people. And uh, we are in front of the fact that uh, uh, in, in every industrialized country somehow the, the Marshallian rights uh, uh, system are in a way uh, disappearing. Uh, slowly disappearing in front of a very heterogeneous uh, and very unstable uh, 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 population. And that the new movement, even if fragmented, are trying to uh, uh, respond to that uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, new forms of resistance and, uh, 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 and, and, and sometimes of populist revolts, uh, we don't know how the agency uh, will, uh, will react to that. There is one point that I've raised at the beginning and that is interesting to develop uh, now, but yet to develop in the, in the debate, and it is the fact that uh, in a way, uh, if we argue that uh, uh, the, the, the commodification process uh, is sustainable uh, only if it is accompanied by a re-embedded process uh, which is uh, recreating some sort of social ways of life which are uh, sustainable but also it is, uh, 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 it is uh, sustainable only when it, uh, 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 it, it implies also some sort of forms of, uh, uh, of emancipation. And if it doesn't imply forms of emancipation, the commodification pro process should e has been historically accompanied by a very high degree of violence. So, the, in, in a way, the, 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 uh, uh, the double movement without uh, some form of emancipation uh, has to be accompanied by, by high degree of violence and this open a, a question mark what will happen in the industrialized country where now the rate of emancipation accompanying the, the new commodification uh, 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 waves uh, is really very limited uh, and it is becoming more and more limited so we, we have two problems one problem is uh, Pro social protection, we don't have enough resources <coughs> for social protection, for the re-embeddedness uh, part of the movement, and uh, we have, uh, 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 we have, uh, uh, and on the other side, we have uh, 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 the, the, the fact that the emancipation move of uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, double movement is uh, vanishing. So, the, the conclusion is uh, uh, a, 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 a question mark. Uh, Michael Piore, uh, 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 many years ago, uh, commenting the double movement, was saying, well, 
Folani is, has uh, a very uh, important approach because it is uh, much more open-ended than the other visions uh, of, uh, uh, of the capitalist development. Uh, that the Marxist or even the Weberian vision, of the, certainly the Durkheimian vision, all the sociological vision of, uh, of, of capitalist development uh, were some sort of uh, in, in a way or another a bit teleological and uh, uh, close. Uh, Polanyi is, is very open. This is true. I think this is the importance of Polanyi. But this poses also a, 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 a question because if uh, the, the double movement began, at a certain moment the double movement will end. Huh? So, will it end and how it will end uh, I think it is interesting to take into uh, uh, consideration the recent article that uh, Wolfgang Streck wrote for the, for the New Left Review, in which he says, well, capitalists have began to end, but the end will be long, will be turbulent, will be chaotic, uh, we will still have to use uh, the double movement to interpret uh, the, the, the pr perspective of change and within the double movement we will have to see some sort of uh, new forces uh, that enter and shape uh, the transition to a different society. I don't know if it will be better or if it will be worse, but certainly we are in a turbulent transition. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Can you direct your question to a speaker or to all four? Uh, and we can start by doing it one at a time and see if, uh, if we need to group up. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm James Hutzel I'm from the London School of Economics, and I'm really happy to be back here. The last time was nine years ago, I think, for a planning conference. Um, for the last 21 years, I've been teaching about development at the London School of Economics. And I got some, and I've been lecturing to students, keeping them informed about Polanyi. They read Polanyi every year. And I had some gratification. The last examination round, I was reading this examination, and it was a student, I don't know who it was, because we do it in the there. But he was making a strong argument about why the state was still really intrinsically important in, in the development process. And he said, we cannot anymore uh, accept the laissez fairy tales that come from <laughs> So I, I want to celebrate that, and I still don't know who to cite. Um, but that leads me to this point that I have. Um, and it's a little bit of uneasiness with um, Jerome's presentation. You know, living in Europe as well, we're facing the UK Independence Party. We're facing Marie Le Pen. Um, uh, who, who's really threatening in France. And you see, I think that I have a problem with the implications of what you're saying about the European Union. And I'm going to come back to it in a second because it then falls, it follows from my question that goes to the first presentation. Right? One of our big, one of the big problems it seems is that the uh, neoliberalism has become much more ideationally congenial to social movements, mm -hmm. much more. So if we look, maybe not in the trade unions, but our trade unions are shrinking to, to a very minority status among social movements. So in terms of the new internet movements, etc. The, even if we look at most of the anti-capitalist movement, there is an anti-statism that is driving a lot of these young people. And I think it's a very serious problem. It's partly due to the bankruptcy of our social democratic parties that have caved into neoliberalism, partly due to the scholarship of Jim Scott, who I 
had great admiration for, but precisely because of his views as he expresses them and seem like the state. Um, and so I think this is, this is happening at the same time as the anti-liberal impulse has been captured by what are proto-neo-fascist, <coughs> anti-immigrant parties, uh, very narrow, inwardly looking um, uh, political movements. And we're suffering this across Europe in every single country. It's a very dangerous movement. Um, and I don't know how it's happening here in Canada. I haven't been able to follow it since I left 26 years ago, but um, um, I'd like to hear. Um, and so that brings me, and I'd love you to comment on that, because I think that's absent when you say that one has to focus on social movements and the role they play, and that's what Piketty didn't do. So, but finally, in, in terms of Europe, again, coming back to the nation state as, as an agent of development, the problem in Europe is that we don't have robust enough states within the member states who can endorse a robust state at the level of the European Union. It becomes very problematic, I think, some of the implications of what you're saying, withdraw from the European Union because it's become an agent of neoliberalism. So if you could just clarify that, I'd be very happy. Sorry. Um, I believe first that uh, battle should be engaged, you know. Uh, for instance, it should be possible to, to say to Germany, uh, in the French constitution with the goal it is possible. Uh, we invoke the plein pouvoir, article 16 of the constitution, we take the control of the central bank, and we decide to monetize the public deficit. Uh, in the constitutional text in France, it is possible. Sarkozy himself, in spite with, uh, by a uh, Guénaud dualist, was thinking about this possibility. Front of Merkel <coughs> to, and even the present uh, director of uh, EMF, Lagarde, said, Germany is a mercantilist state. You know? So if you want to make the battle with a mercantilist state, we can engage the battle like that. So, before, uh, you know, uh, escaping the European Union, I think that that's, that kind of battle should be engaged. And I remember that, maybe I'm not well informed, that the UKIP in Britain was founded by a left person, no, in the regime 20 years the first person who found, I read in the Monde Diplomatique, that it was somebody from left and the UK uh, turned left to right because many left people in Britain were against the European process. Many, that's true, but it's not founded by a left person. Well, I, I read it in the Monde Diplomatique, but well, it's, it's a detail. Huh? So, uh, Yes, the, the battle can be, can be made around the current settlement question because this issue come on the rest, I think. Thank you, Fred. Mm -hmm. Fred, oh. okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I could go on for a long time on this question, <laughs> but I, I think you're absolutely right that, the, um, that many young people, many of these social movements are drawn to a, an anti-politics. I mean, and, essentially we're make the argument in the book that 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 is part of the of the enduring appeal of free market ideas is their claim that they will eliminate the the ugliness of, of politics. I, I mean I think that the the answer um, in terms of um, social movements and politics 
um, is the Polanyian answer of essentially multi-level contestation. And you know that it before the crisis um, in the in you know the uh, the battle against the WTO and the uh, anti-globalization movement and so forth uh, that did capture the imagination of young people. There was this essentially close link between um, movements um, that were locally based, nationally based, that were then interconnecting on a global basis to essentially challenge the, the rules of the game, the, the fundamental structures. And I think that you know, when we look now for answers in Europe, in, in America, in Asia, um, we're not going to find them because they're, they can only be found um, in an effort to simultaneously um, build movements at the national and at the global level. And, you know, that's, that's the political project, you know, and <laughs> the sad thing is that we might be, um, you know, that the dogs of war might already have, you know, been released. Well, um, here's a quote that I meant to include in my talk. So this is, this is 1939. This is an early enthusiast of the European Federation. And he said, I love European Federation because, quote, certain economic powers which are now generally wielded by the national state could be exercised neither by the Federation nor by the state. Anybody guess who said that? Hi. Okay? And it was the truest thing, probably the only true thing, that, that Hayek ever said. So Europe has metamorphosed into its opposite because the Delors Constitution, the Maastricht Constitution, privileges free movement of capital goods, services, and persons. And any social policies are secondary. They're not part of fundamental European law. Um, uh, in the social democratic heyday, Polanyan heyday of the post-war era, the state was the instrument of political <coughs> democracy as a countervailing force against uh, the free market and against the concentrated political power of capital. The idea that the state was uh, the executive committee of the ruling class, as somebody said, that was risible. That, that was not what life was like in 1960. Guess what? Half a century later, the state is the executive committee of the ruling class. We, we have Goldman Sachs providing the Treasury Secretary, whether the president is Republican or Democrat. We have the European Union and the European Central Bank mainly doing the bidding of bondholders at the exclusion of everybody else. So, uh, to echo your point, what happens when the state is widely seen as and actually becomes uh, an instrument of the ruling class because it's in bed with capital, very different sense of embeddedness? Uh, <laughs> two, two things happen. <clears throat> two things happen. Uh, rank and file, working class people turn against the state and turn against the social democrats. Uh, right wing proto fascists, anti liberals uh, disparage in particular the EU and invoke nationalistic uh, ideals of the pre EU state. And young people in the internet age uh, become uh, neo libertarians. We don't need the state, we can do all this neat stuff without the state. And even radicals, and I give you the Occupy movement, become anarchists. And the problem with anarchists, as we know, is they don't get organized. So, um, what you say is very true, and it's it's very serious. And and the practical dilemma is that with a whole generation of social democrats having been proud to have been part of the founding of the EU at a time when it was a center left project, mm -hmm. now it has weakened, just as high a forecast. It's weakened nation states, but it's also delivered a weak continental government. And what does that mean? It means that it's increased the power of the market, it's increased the power of instability. And the fact that the EU is a coalition of whatever it is this week, 28 different nation states, makes a politics almost impossible. The default setting is weak government in action, markets rule. So I wish Polanyi were here with us, maybe he'd have some answers. But this is, in its own way, every bit as tough as the challenges of the interwar period.
Well, I, I, I agree, I'm, I'm particularly worried also, as you are. Uh, I, I have the impression that, the, uh, in a way, a generation of uh, uh, left-wing intellectual, but also not left-wing intellectual, has posed some sort of irrealistic ex expectations on the European construction. And uh, the idea that uh, uh, the, the European Union would some sort of correct uh, the deviation of uh, uh, the redistribution uh, tensions uh, at the nation state level and will somehow mild up the, the transition that we are in. And it is clear that it is not. It is not. That, uh, but that even without the European Union, we will have. Uh, uh, the same problems. I, I, I don't think we will skip populism uh, 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 without the, the, the populist uh, uh, mounting thing uh, without uh, uh, the European Union. In fact, the, the idea is it was at the, at the start, uh, well, we will, the European Union will mild up some sort of regime, very some sort of right wing regime like the, the Hungarian one. But uh, it is the, also this is not happening. So, uh, in a way, the, 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 the tension is that uh, uh, on the redistributive <laughs> side of, the, uh, of, the, of politics, uh, uh, there is a, a really some sort of a very turbulent uh, 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 period which is very worrying for our future. And the American election was ordinary, suppressed working class people turning against the party that is associated with the state that is perceived to be corrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the terrible task of asking people to pose their questions briefly, and I think we'll take a group of questions, uh, because otherwise we won't have a chance to hear all of you. So if the speakers can listen carefully and uh, take some notes, uh, we'll take the four questions that are uh, Okay. Go ahead. Well, hi, Andrew Fisher from the Institute of Social Studies in Hague. Uh, I'm a Canadian. I studied under Kerry and <laughs> huge influence by her. And I, have, uh, I just two quick questions. One, one is to Fred and Margaret, and now I can call you Peggy. Uh, and, and of course, I, I agree with uh, most of what you said, and I'm a fan of your work. But I'm just wondering why you use the term, if you're advocating for a return to political economy, uh, why you're using the term pre-distribution, given that. The theory of distribution was a fundamental part of classical political economy and the understanding that that's fundamental to a political outcome rather than a sort of a, a technical uh, economic outcome. And, and, and on top of that, it, it, I, I find that the critique that James Galbraith made of McKinney's work resonates a lot with what you're saying in the sense that he pointed out that the rate of profit is endogenous to the distribution between profits and wages, and hence the quick, easiest way to reduce the rate of profit is to increase wages. And that's much closer to uh, a type of activism that social movements can engage with rather than trying to impose global wealth taxes and so on. The second question is just to, um, yeah, Jérôme, uh, I, I, I was just wondering if a much more simple and straightforward uh, explanation for the way neoliberalism has crippled the ability of Europe to deal with its economic crisis is, is on one hand, well, it's basically about the retrenchment of the redistributive capacity of a regional state because uh, on one hand, if you compare it to the U.S., 20% of the national income of the U.S. passes through the federal government, and even that is considered to be too small, and in Europe it's about 1%, I think. Uh, and, and, and hence that lack of capacity is then, uh, the, the response to the lack of capacity is rather than having a monetary union whereby all countries are <laughs> issuing bonds uh, guaranteed by the European Central Bank, they're issuing bonds that are priced at a national level, and hence you have low interest rates for the central economies and high interest rates for the peripheral economies versus the US that has uh, essentially managed uh, a system through the uh, through Federal Reserve. And th th it's this, this new, the, in, in that sense, the neoliberal, neoliberalism has been much more exaggerated in, Europe, in, the, in the, sort of the architecture of the European monetary union than in, than in the US. And I'm wondering if that's just a much more straightforward economic explanation. Take our next question, and I'll ask you to please be brief. Sid Greenfield, I'm an anthropologist, and I'll, I want to make just an observation. 
and you can think about the other question while I do this. And the observation is based on Robert Cutman's notion of Polanyi as a trespasser. I want to add that when Polanyi came to Colombia, it was through his contact with Conrad Ahrensberg and others that he learned about anthropology and became involved in anthropology. <coughs> anthropology at that time also was a trespasser. It was a trespasser in academia and in the social sciences. And what it did was bring from its studies of other people, that lousy word, primitive, new perspectives that were not based upon the theories and the data coming out of Europe and America. What it was able to do was to criticize these and cast them in a different light. What happened, though, was anthropology. Polanyi became the inspiration for what was economic anthropology. But anthropology in the 1960s and 70s became an academic discipline and was accepted and scholasticized in your term. <coughs> as a result, what I would suggest is as we look for alternatives in the future, and I'm going to come back to this on Saturday, you have to look at that period when Polanyi was thinking in terms of anthropology and the rest of the world and outside the framework of the arguments going on, still going on, within the rest of academia, the social sciences, and what becomes our popular discourse. So this is just an observation. Thank you. And we will hear more from Professor Greenfield, and I just want to acknowledge him and welcome him. He's a former student and research assistant at Prop Alliance at Columbia University. I'm Pat Devine from the University of Manchester. Is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, comment on, on, on Fred and, and Peggy's uh, paper. Um, the plan is quite clear that the, the, the first movement, the creation of laissez-faire, was planned by the state and introduced by the state and the institutions which supported it were created by the state, as has happened much more recently with globalization. It didn't just happen automatically. It was created by the nation states uh, who created the framework within which it could operate. Um, the second, uh, the, the double movement, if you like, the counter movement, uh, I've always seen as a protective movement against the adverse consequences of what the states had created I, they say fair. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about regulation or deregulation, or as you prefer it, uh, regulation, not deregulation, but re-regulation, one can see that the state's role is changing. It's already been referred to that in the golden age, the state played a protective role. <coughs> now it's playing a role which is quite the opposite. <coughs> so it, it does seem to me that what we have to ask ourselves is why did the role of the state change in the way that it did? And I think that brings us to the point that Polanyi makes, that um, you can't have a market economy without a market society. And therefore, if you try to impose checks on the operation of the market, as protection does, then that causes problems for the operation of the system, as it did in the 70s when it came to a head with the great inflation. And so the then question is, okay, so if that happens, are we expecting that there would be, if you like, a re-regulation and then a new form of regulation which removes the protections to some extent, followed by another, if you like, second movement where we have a new wave of protection against the ravages that neoliberalism is imposing. Um, now, Gareth Dale in his book doesn't like that way of thinking about things because he suggests that it makes one think about, if you like, a cycle within capitalism and then the different phases of capitalism, which are just going on to be repeated indefinitely. Whereas, that's not what Polanyi argued. Polanyi argued that unless you get rid of the fictitious commodities, i.e., unless you get rid of capitalism, then you are constantly going to find yourselves in this situation. So that's why it seems to me that it's very important that we, we are aware of the 
ways in which the current round of, if you like, state-organized deregulation or less regulation or less protection for both nature and labor, don't know about money so much, but um, unless we do that, then what we, are, what we are doing is feeding into what you might call a, a sort of uh, reformist view of how one should deal with the crisis, as opposed to a revolutionary view, or at least a transformatory view, of ways of intervening which bring one closer to the transformation of capitalism. And that, of course, does mean one has to focus on the fictitious commodities and how one deals with removing them from the sphere of market forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just have one to make um, three quick points. I'm not looking at this side from the University of Manitoba. Um, firstly, quickly about the state, just as there is the uh, notion in Marx that uh, the state is nothing but the executive committee of the good cuisine, there is also an equally important Marxian notion that the state is a terrain of class struggle. It is the resume of the balance of forces in civil society. And so that, in a sense, the way in which one can uh, understand the, the, the sort of difference between, say, liberal society and then, say, post war society is that in post-war society, other classes, non-capitalist classes, require the state to make important concessions, of course. And so that even while remaining the executive committee of bourgeoisie, it is compelled to act in a different fashion. At least that's one way of thinking about it. Um, secondly, I'd like to say that uh, I couldn't agree more with um, uh, Professor Patsel here, who said earlier, pointed out uh, the point about how young people and social movements are so implicitly neoliberal. In fact, I've been going on about two things. In fact, I think that neoliberal in at least two senses. They believe in two very problematic notions. Number one, Proudhon's economics and network politics. Um, and I think both of these rely on a sort of civil society conception. Um, and I have a long critique of Negri and Hart and so on, which is a, yeah, anyway. So I, I, I just want to endorse that, and I want to point out that um, it's really important for us to think about this because both Karl Polanyi and Karl Marx, and I think they have a lot more similarities as I will talk about tomorrow, they have a lot more in common than, than we imagine, and both of them seem to assume a certain automaticity of resistance to the power of capital. And they could do so because they either lived in times when the working class was already highly organized, or they could easily anticipate that it would be so. So I think that we, because we now live in considerably different times, we need to problematize exactly how organization happens. And finally, I want to say that um, instead of thinking about the double movement as somehow cyclical, that you have disembeddedness, and then you will get embeddedness, and then you will get disembeddedness again, and then again embeddedness, I think we need to think about it as a more or less linear process. And if not linear, then at least a spiral process. Let me just give one very prominent example. Between the Great Depression and today, why was the Great Recession not as severe as the Great Depression? Even very mainstream economists point out that this was due to the so-called automatic stabilizers that exist within the capitalist system. And that means that we're not, even after 30 plus years of neoliberalism, we have not gone back to disembeddedness. There is a certain stickiness to embeddedness, and I think we need to take that into account. Thank you very much. I think we could go on for the entire afternoon. There's been a lot of rich and, and, and important comments made. Can I ask each of the speakers to respond in one minute so that we can then go <laughs> to lunch? Or, you know, to, but, but to assume that this is an ongoing conversation and not to end it, that this is the beginning of a conversation. I'll start at, uh, at the end with, uh, with Enzo. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm sorry <laughs> about that. We we'll missed lunch. No, I I uh, I, I agree with with uh, with uh, the problem related uh, raised in the uh, in the debate. I think that uh, we are in, in really interesting time, and I think that uh, in a way the uh, this embedding uh, re embedding process uh, it changed a lot, and we have to understand the present conditions 
and the present conditions are that the disembedding is uh, more and more some sort of uh, 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 limited in its uh, in, in its capacity to really uh, create. Uh, new emancipating occasions, uh, at least in, in our societies, but not in the, uh, in the global south, not in the emerging countries, uh, not for millions of uh, uh, Chinese peasants. And then this is another question. And the re-embedding is also very problematic today, and it's very difficult, uh, very different from, from, uh, from other ones. And then I think uh, we have to rethink at the open-ended thing. And we have at least to take into consideration the, the idea that uh, the second movement, the, the double movement is fading up because it is not, uh, it will not strongly uh, 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 create uh, uh, a new occasion and that, the, the, that there, may, the, the, there will be some sort of different uh, responses. Uh, and probably uh, we will have to take in mind the idea that the fictitious commodity have to be uh, uh, abandoned in a way, and have to, that there is, it is certainly it is not sufficient for that. Uh, the protection is not sufficient, and uh, is becoming less and less valuable. Uh, I think I will make a detailed answer. <laughs> but um, as for the embodiment of a neoliberal credo in the European Union, you can find the directive sur les travailleurs détachés, that is to say the, the rule who uh, specifies the freedom to the, the bosses, you know, uh, not to pay to social security. In fact, it is uh, a war machine against the system of redistribution. It is a gift for the European Union. And, you know, Hayek was in favor of a federation, but Lionel Robbins also, I remember now, he was a big federalist. I'm, I'm afraid, uh, I would disagree with Enzo Meccione as for the money question. Because do you remember the irrealistic rate of exchange of euros since a decade? Uh, the deflationary consequences uh, in wage uh, is, uh, is obvious. Uh, about uh, the public <coughs> deficit also. And the consequence of hard money policy is the rising of the public debt and after the cutting in the uh, public policies. You know. So there is a specificity in the European Union you know, as well as the of issue. It is the reason a Danish and Sweden nation refused the, the EU. So uh, it is not true to say that the European Union or not, no, no, the European Union has uh, made a sort of uh, special and catastrophic neoliberalism. neoliberalism. Imagine, as for Greece, it would have been possible to, uh, that the Greek people sh should recover the you know, uh, and with the abolition of the debt, the debt, the the debt. Because in reality, Merkel and Sarkozy accepted, but after the processes, not in the beginning. The, the best solution would be to uh, to coupe the moitié de debt in the beginning of the process. But in order to save French bank, German bank, etc., etc., uh, it was. Uh, the souffrance is inutile. Uh, <coughs> so, you know, but the important is to save the EU. That's, that's the useful affair. So I think that the European Union has special uh, responsibility in the catastrophe in the South. 
Portugal, uh, and Greece, uh, especially. Wow. Um, I think it's almost a, a, a practical impossibility to imagine that progressive forces could capture uh, the European Union. I'm very pessimistic on that. And I don't have a solution because I don't think everybody quitting the European Union would, would be a good idea either. The gentleman from Manchester asked a really important question. Why did the role of the state change? And I think it's important to realize what an anomalous period in history of capitalism the post-war movement actually was. You had a harmonic convergence of events where in, in Ruggie's term that, that helped popularize Polanyi, the statesmen of that era understood that you needed the compromise of embedded liberalism. You didn't want another war. You didn't want another Great Depression. And so elites in that period accepted the necessity of a lot of constraints on capitalism. And uh, elites who had gotten into bed with Hitler were discredited. And there was no neoliberal right. There, there were Christian Democrats. But there almost were no advocates of laissez-faire other than Hayek off in the ivory tower in, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And eventually, it's a, re a regression to the mean. Eventually, capital, which is naturally uh, disproportionately powerful in a capitalist economy, regains the political power that it had lost and starts wearing away at that social contract, which had as its political basis a strong trade union movement, strong public enterprises, all kinds of things that weaken the domain of capital. So the, the challenge of getting that back is above all a political challenge. I mean, all of these systems that involve this role for the state or that role for the state are dependent on what's the base of, of who is mobilized politically, and unfortunately, uh, progressive forces are demobilized. Uh, Proto-fascist forces are on the march. Young people think, uh, let's just be libertarians. Mm -hmm. And this is really a mess. So uh, in part, it's an ideational challenge, a narrative challenge, and in part, it's a political organizing challenge. Fred, Peggy, last word. OK. Uh, a brief one, please. Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, focus. Great question, but let me just focus on, on the one on the state. Um, there's, it, there's, there's never been a protective state one time in history and the capitalist state in the other hand. The, the state has always had a dual role simultaneously. The question has always been what is the relative power of the different aspects of the state? Polanyi's you know, mysterious Spinelman chapter is basically the story of the dual state. The state on one hand gives us the protection of Spinelin on the other in 1795, and in 1795 imposes the most drastic uh, anti-combination laws ever seen in English history, in which it was not uh, a problem of, of, uh, um, of labor, but a problem of treason to be organizing uh, labor unions. And his argument in that chapter, which is so, always so lost, is that the problem isn't Spinamlin in itself. The problem was that there was no possibility of the working class organizing itself as a class because of the anti-combination laws. So, and then you know, 30 years later, you have the new poor law at the same time as you have the beginnings of the regulation of the working day. The same, the, this is always a, a question of relationship, this duality. So um, the to the, you have Vietnam in the '60s and the and you know and Hoover, um, you there was always a, a segment of, of the state which was holding on to what we used to call in the '70s the capitalist state. Um, and um, so um, the question is the social state and, and which is fed and nurtured by democratic processes, which Polanyi, of course, argues that's the essence of socialism, the democratic subordination, uh, subordination of the market to democratic forces, and uh, the, the elements that have always advanced the interests of capital. So then the question of um, getting rid of the commodities, there's one, the fictitious commodities, there's one sense in which the tragedy is that larger and larger proportions of our population are people that no one wants to commodify anymore. And creating a new level of social exclusion 
in which no, people don't even have the right to earn. And so even, it's not slavery, but it's, it's a, a, an effective reimposition of not having the right to earn. So uh, I wanted to make that point. The last thing about how it changes, when, when you have a crisis like we had in the 70s, uh, the oil crisis, the inflation, et cetera, that's always an opportunity. Not necessarily, as we saw in 2008, it doesn't necessarily happen, but when there's a crisis, it's an opportunity for an oppositional force that's been marginalized up till then to come in and do a whole set of ideational, uh, ideational work. And the first thing it does is it has to explain to people why everybody, the liberals, got it so wrong before. And not you're all a bunch of dunces, but rather it's understandable that you thought that this the state was, you know, was the solution. But gradually re reimposing a new understanding of reality. So it's not just an overnight thing, it's a it's a very strong uh, developmental process, which uh, which we argue happens in the transition between poverty and perversity in the, the new welfare regime. So that process of how that ideational work is done is really, really worth our understanding. And I think it's there in Kalani, too. Can I say something? Can I? Very quick. It's not like any lunch. No lunch. OK, <laughs> I, I'm the last thing before lunch. But I, just to pat, I, I mean, in other words, for me, the essence of Polanyi is that he breaks apart the reform versus revolutionary binary, and he suggests the project of transformational reformism. How do you construct structures at the global scale that will allow the reform process to go forward? And so from, in that sense, I just wanted to piggyback on what Bob Kutner said, because before the right came to power, you know, in the crisis of the 70s, there was a moment in which the left had the opportunity to build on the achievements of the earlier period and essentially engage in further transformation in a progressive direction. But that, the, that there was essentially a failure of memory. Social Democrats did not understand their own history. Those of us on the left in the US, there had been discontinuity. We didn't know, you know that we were engaged in a longer term project of transformational reform. Thank you very much. Okay, good note to end. Thank you very much. Before we break, applaud.